Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar this month, March of 2021. I am Hamilton Gardner, one of the founding partners of Home Clifton Gardner, and uh, I'm excited to have you all here today. And we have a wonderful guest, um, Ben Duenwald, who will be popping in right now. Hey, Ben. Hey, Hamilton. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. Th thanks for joining us today. And also with, with him is Daniela Dale. Hi, hey, thanks for having us, Hamilton. Absolutely. Well, uh, Ben, I mentioned this before we started, but uh, I noticed on, on this slide how much younger we'll, we're looking in these pictures. Hopefully, it's uh, it's just the, the pandemic that's doing that, and we're actually getting younger, just like Daniela told us earlier. But that being said, uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you all for participating. Ben, thanks for being here. Um, and thank you for taking off some time during the March Madness. Starting this afternoon, this evening, don't switching from this webinar right into the games. So without further, further ado, I wanted to introduce obviously our speaker today, Ben Duenwald. He started his career in finance over 20 years ago. He's built his career around helping families and business owners build financial plans to reach their personal goals. He has also helped over 100 companies build institutional retirement plans. Through the years, many of his clients have gone through the process of preparing and selling their businesses, which has led Ben to co-found the Washington chapter of SEPA, or Certified Exit Planning Advisors, which is part of the Exit Planning Institute, EPI. So welcome, Ben, and thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Hamilton. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, it's been a long year. So yeah, we're... Uh, uh, for everybody. And I really wish we were standing in a boardroom right now uh, so I could move around a little bit, a little easier to talk, not stuck to a chair, but you know, we'll, uh, we'll make do. Uh, and I wanted to, before we uh, got into the presentation, just again, introduce my partner, Daniela. Uh, her and I, um, you know, we work together uh, through the SEPA chapter. Um, she actually, through all the business owners we've worked with, uh, she kind of brought this, um, to the forefront and kind of introduced our team to uh, the idea of, of creating this in Washington and, and really helping business owners, uh, you know, all the struggles we've seen them go through, like really, you know, spend some time and, and, and put this together. So, uh, you know, as, as we interact with folks, um, it'll be myself or it'll be Daniela, but I just wanted to thank her and, and, and give her a little uh, shout out. So um, Mike, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll, um, kind of go ahead and, 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 and go forward to um, in the introduction slide. Uh, you know, what we're going to talk about today, um, you know, is, is we're going to talk about determining order readiness. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means uh, and give you some real life examples. You know, Hamilton and I have, have shared stories in the past and we'll share some of those with you today of uh, conversations we've had and experiences we've been through uh, while working with business owners. Um, Mike, next slide, please. So, you know, just a little bit, you know, I wanted to touch on kind of what SEPA is and, you know, what the Exit Planning Institute is, is, is I'll use those words as we're, as we're talking today. Um, you know, first of all, you know, the Exit Planning Institute uh, is an organization uh, around the country and it's really uh, gaining strength, um, you know, from coast to coast. And the entire goal and purpose of the Exit Planning Institute is to, as we mentioned, help business owners. Uh, I think they're, they're a group that, that we're seeing as uh, we continue to um, all get older, I guess, Hamilton, to your point, you know, we're all getting older. This, the, the group primarily that, that, that we find in this space right now, uh, they're that group that was born 1946 to 1964, right? They're the baby boomers and uh, they've been through a lot and they have that that adventurous spirit that has, um, you know, really propelled them into owning their own business. Uh, and now is for some of them propelling them to try to exit their businesses on their own uh, to, you know, not great success in some, in some cases. Uh, and SEPA, SEPA stands for Certified Exit Planning Advisor. So, you know, the, the real goal of, of SEPA is to create a, a group of, of advisors, of professionals that are speaking the same language, 
uh, working towards a, a common goal and, you know, focusing on the, the business owner as maybe Mike, let's move to the next slide. So, you know, we'll do that. We'll talk about that today. We're going to talk about um, just kind of briefly, you know, as I mentioned, like what are the success rates um, of, of businesses transitioning? Talk a little about the state of odor readiness. So, you know, what does it take to be ready? Um, you know, when we go through and talk to our clients, what does that mean? Clients that look like they're ready to sell. And then some of the common issues that we, that we see. And so, you know, those issues that if we can pinpoint them early on, uh, we got a much better chance of, of success. So as we take a look uh, at the next slide, we'll start with just kind of review of those um, success rates. So one of the things is as we found these chapters across the country, so as the Washington chapter, what, one of the primary kind of starting points is that we sent out a survey. So, you know, we're, we're sending out a survey to local business owners and we're trying to find out what are their challenges? What are their concerns? What have they been through? Um, we, we take that information. Uh, we put together business roundtables where we're discussing the results of those surveys. And some of the statistics that, that we found um, is, is one, 76 of owners, 76% of owners plan to transition um, their business over the next 10 years. So uh, if you think about that from an advisor standpoint, whether you're their attorney, their CPA, their, their coach, their, their value advisor, their family advisor, um, you know, that's nearly four and a half million businesses or $10 trillion in wealth that they're looking to, to transition. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the ways that they transition that, um, but that's, that's a staggering number of folks that are, are ready to, to move on. Uh, the the mind blowing thing when you think about these the, the folks that run these businesses have started them what it took to get them up off the ground and the the what they do day to day to run those businesses you know forty nine percent of them have no transition plan right so literally have no plan in place for the next phase the next step how they're going to sell that business and because of that because of the lack of planning because of the lack of uh, putting the right people in place to help them. More than 70% of businesses that are put on the market do not sell. So, um, and there's a lot of reasons that happens. Um, when I very first saw that number, I could hardly believe it. Um, but when, you, when you're going to market and looking for that, like a substantial amount of the businesses that are, they want to sell don't get sold. And those that do may not get sold at the price they want, the deal structure they want. And then a lot of times we're talking about family-owned businesses, right? That they're not looking to sell to outside and they're, they're just trying to like keep it in the family. And only 30% of them transition to the second generation and only 12% of them survive to the third. So really the statistics, uh, when we're looking at this, uh, you know, these are the numbers that, that speak out to us about, you know, wanting to, to help, you know, and in my, in my day job, uh, I've, you know, a wealth advisor. I've been, you know, as, as Hamilton mentioned with Merrill Lynch for over 20 years. And I started this because, you know, really there's a lot of need and desire to get this done right. Um, so Mike, let's move to the next slide and let's talk a little bit about, you know, just some of the things that we see. Like if we sit down with an owner and they're ready, you know, when they're ready to go and we feel like they've done the work uh, and they're prepared to sell their business, I kind of want to go through these to set the stage and then we'll, we'll, we'll tackle some of the, the, the issues that we have. Um, first, you know, they've spent the time and money um, to get educated on, on what their options are and how to sell a business. Um, you know, I think about it like I got started with a, with a single book that I picked up, right? Went online, bought the book. Um, it was really kind of the, the beginning of, you know, understanding the challenges specifically this generation, these business owners are facing and moving on. Um, it could be as little as they've, they've spent the time, right? To, to, to read a book about the process. Um, and then they've discussed it with their loved ones, right? So, you know, when you think about it from a, a family standpoint, you know, they, they, we're, we're going through that. Um, second, they have a personal financial and, and business goals that are all aligned, they're defined, they're codependent. And, and what I mean by that is personal planning, financial planning, you know, business planning. 
So I think a lot of times, maybe you have a personal plan with your spouse, right? You've sat down with your partner. You've talked about what your life goals are. Maybe you have a financial plan with your wealth advisor. You know, you can see the numbers. You, you, you spend two hours a year doing your meeting, reviewing the numbers of your plan. How's your portfolio doing? And with your business, you know, you've got your team, you've got your co-owners, you've got your, your maybe you've got your business coach, you know, you've got business goals. But we, we call master planning, we call it master planning when all three of those, because everyone's at the same table, are co-linked and are focused on one objective, right? And so, you know, it's, it's having all of that laid out so you can see it and everyone knows what each other's doing. That you've got an advisory team, um, you know, that could be a long list of folks. We'll get into that, but that you have a team around you. Um, you know, I think that for most business owners, they don't want to be the quarterback of that team. You know, they don't want to be having to call one advisor and, and, and get to the other advisor and make sure they're bringing in the right people at the right time. Like they're running a business. Um, so, you know, having a team, having a quarterback of that team and have that in place the next, you know, talking about the, the family members, um, contingency plans, buy sell instructions, you know, appropriate insurance, um, you know, specifics. What would happen, you know, if you could no longer, you know, operate the business? Um, and I think maybe this is a good point. You know, Hamilton. You know, when I think about contingency plans, right, and, and, and think about that with with clients, uh, is there something that you often recommend? Um, you know, when you, when you're talking to your clients specifically about contingency plans. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Ben. Um, you know, I've, I've thought about this and, it, and it's interesting that we're actually talking about the sale of a business when often um, from a legal perspective, you're talking, you should be talking about these contingency plans as you're forming the business. Uh, you know, reviewing your formation documents, taking a look at like what, what those documents mean, what are the terms and the provisions in there. Uh, in particular, that you kind of mentioned in this bullet is actually the buy-sell provision. You know, what does buy-sell provision mean? It means like if somebody wants to get out of it, if you're in a business uh, and you've got some partners and some other shareholders, you know, what is the process and the procedure that you're going to get out of it? Or if you die, you know, if somebody dies, what happens in that situation? One of your partners die. You know, uh, many business owners, they'll get into the business with either a great friend, a trusted colleague. Um, but then they don't necessarily want to be a business partner with that person's family. So that's where your entity documents and your formation documents, your bylaws, your LLC agreement, those types of terms can be put into that either at the outset or as your, you know, your business is growing, it, you know, and it, when it's doing well, start thinking about that. And we often advise to, um, to review it and to put those provisions in your contracts. Yeah, thanks. I know it's, it's, it, it, there's always a lot of uh, documentation and <laughs> back and forth, and it's hard to cross all of the T's and dot all the I's. Um, you know, kind of the next thing I move on, the, the, you know, one of the other things that we really, you know, think it's valuable to see is that, that you've completed an analysis of your business. And, and what I mean by that is a few, and, and, you know, for the sake of time today, you know, there's a lot of things that obviously we could delve into for hours. But, you know, I think from just an understanding of, you know, I think a lot of business owners understand the business valuation uh, aspect of it. Do I think a lot of them have had them done professionally, have had them done correctly? Um, you know, probably not, right? A lot of clients we work with as we're reviewing, you know, what, you know, from a financial planning standpoint or a business planning standpoint, you know, their valuation is based on some number they heard on the golf course or heard a happy hour based on some sale that was done. Um, you know, they don't have a formal valuation, right? And then on top of that, a personal financial and business assessment. And this kind of goes back to the planning that I mentioned, but you know, we go through an entire like a documentation, right? There's a formal assessment, like how ready are you personally to, to sell your business? How ready is your financially? Are you ready? You know, and then lastly, like, is your business ready? And we'll talk about some of those today. But, you know, it's a formal process of scoring yourself. You know, a lot of folks on my team joke that, you know, one of my favorite sayings is you can't manage what you can't measure, right? And so we have a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of things that we're tracking, right? And I think from an owner standpoint, you know, you can't manage these things um, as, as, you know, esoteric as they may be, like you can't manage that, that personal financial and business stuff if you can't, if you can't manage it. 
So, uh, or measure it. So Mike, on the next slide, I, I kind of want to get into just a few more things that uh, we see that folks have when they're prepared. You know, first is that they've considered, you know, all their options, right? So um, they've looked at all their exit options. They have thought about the optimal deal structure and they've kind of gone through the pros and cons uh, of each of those uh, as related to kind of the master plan and, and how that would work for them. So Ben, before you move to the next bullet, can you tell me what do you mean by optimum business or uh, optimum deal structure or considering all your options? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, th I think, you know, th there can be a little bit of, um, you know, just kind of overwhelm, you know, when you think about selling your business, I think a lot of folks just wide off the gate think, you know, if you're not a family owned business, I think about who am I going to sell it to? Right. And it, like, it's some person that just comes in and, offers them a check for the business. Um, I think I could be a little bit, you know, not understanding all your options. So we really focus on eight. I, like when I, when I think about it, I, I try to break it down. There's like eight um, options. There's four, you know, internal options that, that we look at and four external. So um, as an example, you know, I can kind of go through the, the inside options would be, you know, intergenerational, as we mentioned, a lot of family owned businesses. So passing the business from one generation um, to the next, uh, as I mentioned, a, you know, strategic buyer. So, you know, that's where, you know, you're, you're a competition or, um, someone that has a, a business that might fit well with yours comes in and buys your business from you. Um, there is a management buyout. So perhaps you have a strong management team, uh, it's been with you a long time. They're interested in buying the, the business from under you. Uh, and then lastly, internal, there's um, ESOPs, right? Employee stock, ownership, employee stock ownership programs, right? So, you know, there's some real famous ones out there, um, you know, where the, the business was sold and they, they basically will um, capitalize part of the business, right? In order to create the money needed to buy out the owner. And then the employees are there for over time buying the business um, from the owner. So those are kind of the internal, um, you know, and then, uh, Outside options, um, or I'm sorry, so outside options to be sale to a third party. So I, I kind of mixed that one in the front one. So sale to the third party, you know, an outside option, obviously that's kind of the most common and thought of. Um, recapitalization. So when you think about like deal terms and, and, and what to look at, you know, recapitalization is where, you know, we'll take a business owner and perhaps they will, um, you know, take a loan out or, you know, structure a deal internally with their business as to slowly start removing themselves, right? They're not fully removing themselves. Um, an IPO, which is, you know, we don't see that that often in most of the size businesses that we work with, uh, but, you know, that's an option, right? Which is an initial public offering, company going public, uh, or perhaps an orderly liquidation, right? Where um, you've got an asset and perhaps your assets are some of your most valuable parts of your company. And so you are strategically and slowly um, you know, liquidating those assets to fund um, the sale of the business. So, you know, between all of those, you know, there's a lot of options there. They all have pros and cons about the value that you'll get, um, the hurdles that you'll run into, the challenges that you'll have, the time that it will spend to, 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 to execute them. And, and they all ultimately, you know, need to align with what your end goal is. Like, who do you want to own the business? Or is it more about how much money you're going to get out of it? So when we talk about optimal deal structure, it's really spending the time to, to review those plans with clients, see what their end goal is, and then give them a few options to review as to what are ways that they could transition their business. Um, you know, and all of that, right, kind of as we keep going, is it, it's, it, it needs to be written, it needs to be documented. Um, you know, clients that have a design post life, you know, post business life after plan, right, that's linked. Uh, you know, a lot of clients literally will get to the finish line. You know, these are some of those stories that you hear. Um, you know, a, a handful of investment bankers have told me different stories over the years where they've literally got to the finish line with their client and their client would not, did not sign to sell the business. And, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking that, like re, reviewing the deal later, the number one reason they weren't selling the business was because they didn't know what they were going to do next. 
right? They didn't have a plan. They, the business was their stature in the community. The business is what their family knew them was. The business was their income. You know, the business was their identity for 30 years or longer. Now what's next, right? So having a life after plan so that when you put pen to paper and are actually selling your life's work for a lot of folks, you know, you know what that next phase is. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, the last two really are, you know, kind of looking at, do you have projects in place? You know, so first of all, you know, do you have a um, value enhancement program in place? Are you looking at ways to improve the value of your business? You know, do you have 90 day sprints in place? Are you looking at places you can improve? Uh, and then do you have a management program underway to ensure that once you're done, you know, your management team is in place and is um, ready to, to, to take on what's next? So why don't we get into some of the, the hurdles? I mean, I think this is, they, these kind of go hand in hand, but um, I, I wanted to kind of give you, these are the things that are when we see, you know, A plus ready to go business owners that have, have put in the time and effort. These are all the things that we see. Um, but Mike, let's, let's go to the next um, slide. We'll actually just kind of jump right in and, let, and let's talk about um, what are some typical readiness or, or preparedness issues. So, you know, starting on the next slide, Here's a couple of the main ones. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lump them into a few, you know, so you don't have to remember 10 items, right? We'll just remember a few kind of primary ones. So, uh, you know, the first is, you know, loss of identity and lack of support, right? And I think that ties into what I was just referencing, which is um, the identity that a lot of our clients, a lot of business owners have in regards to their business. And I'm gonna take the first two, no goals or objectives post-transition. Um, you know, no considerations uh, to passions outside the business. And, and we do, we walk our clients through, um, you know, we call it a step process. Uh, and, you know, for some, a little bit, sometimes folks think it's a little hokey, but, you know, I've had a lot of these conversations uh, with folks. And when you really get into it with the, with the owner and their family and what's important to them. So steps first stands for spiritual. Um, and what I mean by that is kind of what inspires you. Right. So, you know, I'm sure we've all heard of Stephen Covey's book, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know, and one of the, the, the thoughts in there is that focus on finding your center, right? What inspires you? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Kind of having that conversation. Uh, T is things, you know, I mean, you know, we don't want to be uh, materialistic, but there are things, right? There's things in your life that you have that you, that things you're, in your life you aspire to have, things you don't need anymore. Um, e is for experiences. What experiences in your life have, have you enjoyed? You know, for me, it's like, you know, the day I got married, the birth of my kids, the times I've climbed Mount Rainier, traveling Europe, you know, there's like experiences that I can think of that, you know, I want to either recreate or that were, I, I realized those are the types of things that really have resonated with me over the last 20 plus years. And I would like to do again. Um, and then people, you know, and when I say people, you know, a lot of our, our clients, one of the common things I get about, oh, what are you going to do next? Uh, one of the most common answers, is, well, I'm going to follow my children around, right? They're going to have kids. They're going to move. Like, where are you going to live? I'm going to live wherever my kids live, right? Because that's where my grandkids will be. And that's where I want to spend my time. Um, I'm not sure all of us kids love that, but you know, that's their choice, not ours. Um, and then I would also say from a people standpoint, another thing I've heard a lot of is just, you know, along the way, business owners have relied on a lot of folks. They've built it on their own, but there's a lot of people that have influenced them. And so having the opportunity to, to go thank them, spend time with them, right? Do things when they're not running uh, hundred miles an hour. So, you know, we go through that process with them. Um, you know, advisory board and formal transition team, you know, as I talked about, it's, it, it's, there is a team, you know, I didn't really get into it, but you know, you're talking your CPA, you're talking your attorney, you're talking your wealth manager, your insurance advisor, you're talking your, your family coach, your value advisor, the person that's obviously trying to increase the value of your business. Um, you know, you're talking about your family members, right? Your business partners, right? And this, all of this team should be meeting regularly, just like you would. I know a lot of you probably sit on boards um, you know, or giving your time, um, this board should be meeting the same way, 
right? It should be meeting regularly, talking to the business owner about what they want to accomplish, what concern, what's changed. I mean, literally think about the last 12 months, right? I mean, how I, I have had many, many conversations with owners in the last 12 months. You know, it was like 2000, if you think back, 2008 happened and the baby boomers and the, the business owners, they were like, look, I can do this. I'm not that, you know, I'm not ready to retire. They've built all the way back up from there only to get hit with 2020, you know, and now they're like, okay, maybe it's time for me to do something different. Right. So that's why the board needs to be meeting. This team needs to be meeting to understand where the owner's head's at, you know, and what needs to be put in place. So there's a lot of things that need to get done before um, you get to the, to the table. Um, so, you know, one of these things, and we think about the shareholders and generational transfer, uh, I know Hamilton, you've shared with me before, um, you know, do you have a war story you could share or something about, you know, owners or generations maybe not being on the same page? Yeah, you know, um, that, that's, it's kind of like interesting on, on what happens in, in those situations, you know, one of the most common issues is that I, that I see is that uh, you, you know if the business owner isn't ready, then um, really the financing is probably going to fall through. You know they're not going to be organized. They're not going to get the financing that they that they hope that they hope for, or it's going to take longer than they thought it would. Um, because kind of to your point in the overall theme of of the succession planning and and the selling of your business, it takes time to get ready. It can take years to get ready. And so one of the biggest things is the financing falls through, the deal falls apart, and then a bunch of effort was wasted, you know, and then the, and then the, uh, what I've seen is that the business doesn't ever get sold, you know, and then it goes to that wind down piece and the wind down piece is, is not, uh, it's not good. The, the owners, the clients are disappointed and kind of like that future retirement plans are, are all on hold until, you know, the next phase. Yeah, it's just. It, it, there's so much that needs, there's so much conversation and communication needs to happen, right? Um, so, you know, Mike, let's jump to the next slide. I know we're, we're um, kind of talk about just, you know, another common issue is, you know, how owners see the business, how they use it, right? So, you know, a lot of owners have uh, really high income needs, right? And I look at like, if, the, if uh, one and two income requirements post-transition, Right? Like, how do I, like everybody who retires, right? I had a business, I had a job, now what? Right, now I'm gonna retire, now I'm gonna do something else. How do I replace that? So it is a, it is a battle between needs and wants. Um, you know, I call this, some owners have, you know, again, we call lifestyle businesses, right? Their business allows them to live their lifestyle, right? And, and for some of those, that can be an expensive lifestyle. Right. So another thing as they get to the table, right, they get to that finish line, they have to know, is it enough? You know, if you take a 45 year old business owner who someone knocks on their door and offers them $20 million for their business, that's different than a 67 year old business owner that gets a knock on their door offering it for 20 million. It, 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 you know, it doesn't matter what the business is. I just mean the time and the place of that person that's a different amount of money. Uh, and that's where it's important that the financial plan that has been put together with the wealth advisor, you know, it considers the true value of the business, right? It considers what really is possible. And in light of that, not just what's possible for the business to be sold at, but what will you actually go home with, right? What are the net proceeds uh, and, and how much are you actually going to end up at the end of the day able to use to replace your income with? So how do, Ben, how do you um, define like a net proceeds analysis? Like what do you do in that, that situation? What do you mean by it? Well, as you look at like the, you know, if you kind of go back to the eight, you know, types of ways that we'll, we'll, we'll look at selling a business, you know, they all have their pros and cons about how soon you're going to get the money. What are going to be the tax implications of, of when you get that money? How much planning have you done ahead of time? You know, with a, with a good attorney to, to draft and, and, and create the right structure for your business and the sale, you can dramatically increase the proceeds. With a, uh, a good wealth advisor that has a, a strategy or a plan where they are 
basically banking capital losses for you over the years, you can increase the net proceeds. Um, depending upon the deal that you get, you know, obviously someone walking in off the street, you're going to have a much larger, you know, upfront, right? Whereas could have a bigger tax implication than if you're slowly selling it to management or through an ESOP over time. Uh, and as you know, we know, like, you know, the, the value of the dollar, right? Um, the sooner you have it, the more it's worth, right? So, Oh, I was just going to chime in there on that too, is that one thing I see often in my business, uh, the business sale deals is, is the owner getting paid out over time, you know, where it's going to be a gigantic tax hit in the first year, and they'd rather have that income stream for a number of years thereafter. So it's a, it's a very common, you know, thought by those business owners to think, when am I going to get paid? How am I going to get that money? And what are going to be the tax implications? Because like you said, it, there is a time value man, money, but there's also the tax issue that comes up constantly, which right. talk to your CPA about. <laughs> <laughs> right. No CPAs here. We, um, yeah. So, and, and I think that as you go down, like you think about how long you own it, when you're going to sell it, you know, the next two risk sensitivity and the, the financial plans align, you know, I mean, I'll just touch on this briefly, but you know, we hear all the time about how much risk people take with concentrated stock. You know, do you have a lot of money in a specific stock? But when you think about a, a business owner, they have all, for most business owners that we, 90% of their money is in their company, right? Like when you talk about risk and understanding that, that level of risk, you know, that's a really important conversation. You know, our industry does a, a great job of talking about, you know, I say our industry, like wealth advisor, a great job of talking about return an awful job of talking about risk. Right. And so it's important to understand how much risk you're keeping in this in this one asset. Um, Mike, let's kind of talk. I mean, as I was the next slide is we're talking about tangible versus intangible. We're talking about, you know, concentrated stock companies. Uh, I mean, let me just kind of touch on this. You know, I think that, you know, there's a few things that we, we think about. Uh, and that's from a company standpoint, it's the tangible versus intangible factors. You know, uh, as I alluded to some of those companies, if you think about the most valuable companies on earth right now, right? The Apples, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Teslas, right? What they have is they have this intangible value, right? That is that, that they're marketing, right? And so I think a lot of times business owners are looking at the, the what is the value of their stuff, their assets, right? Versus what is the value of the, the, the processes and the people, which we'll, we'll touch on. Um, and so as we talk about EBITDA, we talk about that with clients, you know, they're not, they haven't really looked at historically what it is, projected what it is. You know, Hamilton and I were talking the other day about ad backs. you know, he was talking about like the client with the cell phone, right? One of his clients says, you know, he was like, well, who pays for that cell phone, right? And he's like, well, the business does, right? Uh, I mean, the cell phone is a small example, right? It could be country club memberships. It could be private planes, Right. These are things that the company is paying for that maybe the new owners don't want. Right. Which by adding that back in increases the value of your business. Right. So having an understanding of what those things are. Um, what are the valuations that you're considering for your business? Uh, again, it's from are you average? Are you above average? Are you best in class? Right. Understanding what those valuations are for your company. You know, is it bankable? How credible is the financial information? You know, I think about all this planning and this work. Right. One thing we say at Exit EPI is that, you know, planning to sell your business is just good business. Right. And part of that is when you think about your financial information and all these things I'm talking about, if someone comes to you and wants to buy your business and they request documents from you and it takes you a month to find two years ago's, you know, financial statements, you know, that's not a good look. Right. That's a red flag right there. So, you know, how how credible is it? Uh, what's your ability to forecast? Um, you know, do you have a management succession in place, customer base? And um, Mike, if you want to jump to the next slide, I can kind of, you know, um, touch on that with, um, and I think this is always a great way, you know, we think about these intangible factors to kind of think about them when you're, when you're talking to um, business owner clients. And that is, you know, the four C's, right, which are human, structural, social, and customer capital. And, you know, I think a lot of these, um, if, I, if I start with human, 
right? Um, human capital is obviously the people in your business, right? It is, it is the, the people you go to work with every day. Um, you know, it's your management team. Um, you know, the, I was looking down because the number 62% of business owners said that the most challenging um, thing that they have that they deal with is finding the right people for their, for their company. Um, and the, uh, we probably all know the book, uh, Good to Great, um, you know, or Built to Last by Jim Collins. Like he puts in there, you know, talking about that human capital. And I always love the way he said, it's like, you got to get the right people on the bus. You got to get the right people in the right seat. You got to get the wrong people off the bus, right? And you always got to put who in front of what, right? And so if you have a good team around you, um, that's supporting you, if you have a good team, obviously that's something that you can gauge. Like you can back to those assessments, like you can assess that and you can constantly try to improve it. Um, structural capital, you know, that's in the four areas. So, you know, processes, people, technology, and facilities, kind of the way we, we look at it. Uh, and we'll, as we talk to owners, you know, it's about what's special about those things for you, right? What, what is special about your processes? And if there's something special about that, is it documented, right? Is it in a three ring binder? Does it live in the cloud, right? Like what is, what is that process? And is somebody willing to pay for that, right? Is somebody willing to, 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 to put a price tag on that because it's documented and because you've proven it works? Um, you know, social capital in today's world, you know, that's your brand. Um, you know, that's a lot of those companies that I laid out. You know, I like to think about it, especially in, you know, my day job where a lot of there's like products and services. You know, I like to think that our clients use us because of the way we do business because of the way that we provide those services because the way we interact right so there's a social there's there's a rhythm to to the way that we engage with our clients and i think from a business standpoint that social capital you have with the community uh is, is extremely valuable and it's also something you can assess and strive to improve and then customer capital um you know, I kind of ask these questions, right? Um, how strong are your relationships with your customers? Um, are you integral to the success? Is what you do or what you offer a key reason that they are successful? Um, are the relationships deep? Are they long-term? You know, and I think the last phrase on this question, are they contractual? Uh, a lot of times business owners, as they get to the end or as they're doing their due diligence, um, do they have, are there contracts in place? You know, this, again, if you have the processes as you're thinking about trying to sell your business, you're going to think about that at the end of the year, at the, of every year. How are my contracts? Are they in place, right? Um, so, and then, you know, lastly, like, you know, are these relationships transferable, right? So I know this, you know, when you think about all of those, uh, I think if you can focus on them and deliver that, that conversation, there's so much value that can be had improving these four areas. Um, Hamilton, I don't put you on the spot, but I mean, do you have any success stories of, you know, these um, items, you know, kind of going through them and helping clients? Yeah. And um, it's, it's, I liked how you finished it and it was, it was a good lead for me too, because a lot of these things really are contracts. I look at like the capital, you know, human, structural, social, customer, and the transferable, you know, when I have plenty of uh, um, calls with clients when they're saying, okay, you know, hey, I want to sell my business. Or, you know, if you get into a dispute between partners, they say, if I leave, then this customer leaves. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing if you're trying to sell your business, because if you leave, then are, are your customers going to stick with you? Um, but, you know, the success stories that I've seen where we've had like a very successful closing is that the owner or the business owners would think about it and get organized ahead of time. Um, they had their contracts in order and they were ready to sell at any time, you know, and they were being approached for years before they finally ever agreed to it. But every single time, you know, they, they had their contracts in order. They had uh, employment agreements with their key personnel that were compensated well, so they wouldn't leave when, when they sold the business, you know, they had customer contracts that were transferable. So, 
that, you know, if you had a key contract, say with like Amazon or Microsoft or Boeing or whoever it was, that contract was going on into the future. Um, and when you sold it, it wasn't just the business owner left and then the, the, the client left, you know, the business could continue to produce under that contract. So, um, you know, in those success stories that I'm telling you where the person kept getting approached year over year over year, he didn't want to sell kind of to your point on that, that lifestyle business, but eventually he said, well, if I find, if I get this number, which was an astronomical number, then, you know, I'll think about it. And a few years later, he got it. So, and then sold the business, retired, doing well. I don't, do you have any of those types of stories? I'm sure you do. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of like, I mean, I've been just through kind of to the beginning of this conversation tonight, you know, so many times where um, there just is, you know, the, the unsolicited offer, right? When you think about like the, the private equity money out there now, and you think about, you know, the explosion of that really over the last, you know, 10 years, you know, it, it, it greatly, right? A lot of unsolicited offers. Uh, and so, you know, I've seen a lot of challenges around these, you know, when you bring these up, just documents and stuff, not in order, right? So, um, I have so more ben, we have a question from the the audience. Do you do do you do um, you know key man insurance or or do you uh, know much about key man insurance? No, we don't. We don't do like personally. I don't do it, but obviously, you know, I've worked with um, you know some some insurance advisors. You know, that's part of the team. Uh, so what the question was: Would key man uh, key person insurance be transferable to like the new owners? And uh, I don't know off the top of my head, and I. I what I would, my response to that would be that uh, it depends on what the terms of that insurance policy are. So it would be talk to your insurance broker who would be kind of like what Ben would describe as part of the team, you know, the team of advisors, you know, talk to your insurance broker on that key man insurance um, on if, if it is transferable. And if it's not, what do you have to, you know, pay to make it transferable? You know, because right. you can always get insurance endorsements and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, like who owns it? right? Uh, does the company own it? Do the owners own it? Right? Like, how does that work? And can it be transferable? You know, obviously, insurance is tricky, because 20 year olds a lot different than a 60 year old, right? So um, Mike, let's go. I know we're, we're kind of um, I, I, I said, I'd be faster. I'm trying. But uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, I think just, as I mentioned, what's before, you know, are there benefits to being ready without wanting to sell. Uh, and I think if you've taken anything from today, I'll say it again, you know, planning to sell your business is just good business. That's just the, the truth. Uh, it pushes the overall um, team. Um, when, when you start talking about benchmarking yourself against your peers in your industry, uh, when you start talking about and thinking about trying to create a business that is, that is sellable, um, you, you, are, you are only going to improve the, the players, your people, right? Uh, it serves as a contingency plan, you know, back to the contracts. I mean, if the last year has taught us anything is that we have no idea what the future holds, right? So being and regularly having those conversations will help serve as a contingency plan if something happens to you. Um, you know, as I mentioned, non-solicited offers happen. And quite frankly, they happen more now than they ever have, right? So if someone knocks on your door and says, you know, I'll give you 20 million for your business, it would be nice to know if that was a good number or not, right? It'd be nice to be able to jump on that if you felt, to Hamilton's example he just gave, like his, they gave a crazy number, right? That they felt was like, and they got that number, right? So having some idea. And then lastly, I mean, just all of those things, reviewing the four C's, having a business, you know, having a board, um, you know, ultimately it's just gonna increase the income to the owner and the value of the business at the end. So uh, I, I would say without a doubt, 100%, there's, a, um, those are the reasons, right? That you, that you start planning to sell your business so that it's better along the way. Tons of benefits. Um, I think we have um, the next slide, Mike, is if we have any questions. Uh, I, and maybe I have, you want to let the audience know how to do that. Yeah, type in the Q&A if you have any questions. Um, one question that I wanted to throw out there for you was like, what is like the top issue or three issues that you see in business owner readiness? Like on your side, what do you see most frequently? Um, 
You know, I think the, the first, the, the, the main issue and the first issue is they don't really know, um, they don't have a, a goal for what they want to get from the business um, because they haven't done, you know, as I mentioned, the master planning, you know, so there's a, there's a disconnect between, uh, you know, and I would say most of these business owners are, are, are generally, you know, they, they plan their business meticulously, right? Like what their goals are for their company. But when it comes to their own goals, they don't really know what that end number is. So number one, I would say is that they just, they're not really sure what they need, you know, what they need to, to move on, to, to exit their business. Uh, secondly, is like right up your alley, Hamilton, you know, they don't have their documents in order. Um, quite frankly, it's not even they don't have them in order. If they can find them, that would be like, you know, the first real good step is that they even know which drawer they're in. Um, I maybe you could share real quick. Didn't you tell me a story about the um, the owner that hadn't updated his his business formation documents? In like yeah, it's a it's a it's a common you know thing that I see as we're going to uh, close a deal or close a sale. This this happens all the time where the business owner, as you said, you know, there, there's financing in place and the bank says, okay, send me over your bylaws or send me over your LLC agreement or like the formation documents. And the owner says, well, I formed this thing like 20 years ago. I don't know where that is. Or I don't think I ever did that. Can you just throw something together? Like, I mean, I've heard, can you just throw something together as we're like two weeks from closing and this person making like their entire retirement is there in that, but they don't have the formation documents. So, you know, find them, get them and organize, put them in that binder that you're talking about. Because so that you aren't saying, hey, can you just throw something together for the bank, you know, in the very, very last minute. And, and I think to that, like to that point as well, you know, I think the, the third thing maybe is that they, they haven't had the conversation with their family or their business partners um, about what they, they, their next steps are. Um, you know, the story that we like to tell is, you know, we had a meeting with a, been a long time client, um, you know, trying to decide if they should sell their business or not. Husband and wife owners, um, you know, they're getting down to the end and he's like, I don't want to sell. Uh, and his wife's like, well, I do want to sell. Uh, and it just so happened that she owned 51% of the business because they had set it up so many years ago um, for, for a few different reasons. Um, but yes, yeah, she was 51% owner. He was 49. You know, like having a discussion with your family and your partners about um, what you want the end goal to be is, is, is truly important. And a planning piece, I think, Mike, we want to respect everybody's time. So, Mike, would you, could you switch to the slide with our contact information so everybody can get that before... Um, we, uh, we head out today. Um, but one thing that, that we didn't touch on earlier was like all of this preparedness will really, you know, avoid future conflicts. One of the things that you kind of mentioned and, and I wanted to, to touch on was when partners and shareholders are in conflict or have different goals, you know, in terms of being bought out or even that husband wife scenario that you just gave. All of this planning will avoid those questions and uh, avoid that conflict. You know, so I do um, a lot of business transactions, but at the same time, I've also gotten involved in a number of business divorces, which are just as ugly as regular divorces. And that's where two partners who started the business as best friends were, you know, in, in each other's weddings and, you know, godparents to the kids and all the rest of that stuff. All of a sudden it's ending in litigation. But um, business divorces are ugly and they, you know, they start, all the skeletons start coming out of the closet. So this planning that Ben's talking about is really, really important. Um, and anything else that you want to kind of leave a uh, final parting thoughts, Ben? No, like I guess I really, I mean, I appreciate the time, you know, that we had today. It was great. Um, you know, this is obviously the kind of tip of the iceberg, you know, as we talk about actually improving the value of the business, you know, what that process is and how it looks. Um, you know, hopefully maybe we can, we can do this again uh, another day, but, you know, I really uh, enjoyed the chance to visit to the group today. And uh, as Mike had our contact information up, uh, we are, um, you know, available for, for questions and we'll touch base with you as well. So thanks again, Hamilton. Absolutely. Thanks, Ben. Um, the webinar recap and the video will be up on our website and YouTube on Monday. Um, please, you know, answer the post webinar survey. Tell us how we did. Um, tell us how young we look in those pictures. And our next pic our next webinar will be the third week of April. Thanks again, Ben. Thanks again, Daniela and Mike, uh, our, our
our PR tech guy on the back end. Thank you, Scott, for you all so much. Have a great uh, weekend and go Zags.